got the stragglers coming in. Okay, good evening. Time to go to church, isn't it? I can't believe y'all came out on this scalding hot evening, <laughs> but I'm thankful. Glad you're here. Um, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask Mike, Brother Mike, would you pray for us? Amen. There is nothing in this life better than the Word of God, is there? Nothing, 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 nothing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so, you know what? We can't go to heaven without faith, and we can't have faith without the Word of God. I believe John MacArthur said, the greatest experience in human life is hearing the Word of God. And the more you think about that, the more real it becomes, you know. Maybe it's a, when I first heard that quote or read that quote, you know, it, you know, there I could see a lot of truth to it, but no, it's, it's completely truth. Um, nothing better than the Word of God. Uh, Sixteen, Matthew's chapter sixteen. If you have your Bibles, real familiar experience in the life and times of Jesus and his disciples. His disciples. I was talking with my sister in Louisville yesterday, and she goes to Southeast Christian, and her and a group of women have Bible study every Monday. What? No, it wasn't yesterday. It wasn't Monday. It's Tuesday, right? Tuesday. And I had the opportunity to go up and teach those ladies uh, one morning. But um, um, we were talking, and she said, you know, Gary, when you take God's Word... And not just break it down verse by verse, but word by word. And that's when you really get into the word of God. Every word is there is God breathed, breathed out of God. And uh, it's called inspiration in the King James. All scripture <clears throat> is given by inspiration of God. And, and every word, every single word. And uh, so I, I love God's word. Uh, chapter 16, Matthew's Gospel, verse 13. And we're only going to go down about to 17, okay? About uh, five verses here in the Word of God. Um, when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Okay, uh, that's a mouthful, I'm telling you. Uh, we could spend an unlimited amount of time just talking about these five verses and what they mean and the impact that they have had upon planet Earth, planet Earth. Here we see uh, Matthew breaks his gospel down into three categories, really, and this is the beginning of the third part of Matthew. This is where Jesus is revealing unto his disciples completely that he will be rejected, that he will be rejected, that he is unveiling the church, that the, ch the, the coming church, which will happen uh, in Acts chapter 2. And, um, and he's heading, now he's really pointing them toward the cross, toward Calvary and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a spiritual kingdom, the sp a spiritual kingdom. Uh, so, we pick up in a place that is, at that time, was one of the most ungodly places on planet Earth. It was called Pansia, Pansia. Now, I know here the King James gives it Caesarea Philippi, 
But Philip, who was the controller of that little region of the Roman Empire, had, had by uh, the writing of King James and the giving of Matthew's Gospel, or I should say the giving of Matthew's Gospel, it had been uh, changed. He had changed the name to Caesarea after Caesar and himself, Philippi, to bless Caesar and then everybody wants to be remembered and his name would be forever on this city, Caesarea Philippi. But in the olden days, it was called Pansia. Now, here's what happened. If you back up in Scripture, Jesus had just left, had just fed 4,000 with a few loaves and a few fishes. He crossed the Sea of Galilee and he headed north north a two days journey some say some say it was 26 miles and i think you can calculate that but um, they covered a lot of territory on foot in two days 26 miles he went to the north to the northern part of israel and right on the border where the jews end and the gentiles begin he had left uh, galilee and israel he had left judah and jerusalem he had left uh, the temple and the synagogues. He had left uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and all of these religious figures and, and uh, uh, places of worship. And now he's on the border of the Gentiles in an ungodly land. Why would he do this? To for the first time, to for the first time, to talk about the church, the church, because this church he knew was going to be made up of those kind of people, Gentile people. The church for two thousand years has been predominantly Gentile. Y'all agree with that? It's kind of elementary. It is. Uh, the Jews wouldn't buy in. Now the Jews that did come to him. Uh, for as many that did believe gave he power to become the sons of God. Ain't that right? But the nation as a whole is still lost, reject, cut off, and will not be as a nation accepted until they say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Right? Ain't that what he told them at Jerusalem? Henceforth is your house left empty and desolate, and you'll not see me anymore until you say, Blessed is he that cometh. So they will accept the Messiah at the end of the tribulation, uh, but there was going to be a gap in Daniel's prophecy, and in that gap he would insert and inject into history the church. The church. Why was he there? Because of those reasons and much more. Look what it says. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Now on their journey, they had just, I forget what the place is called. And, and actually, uh, um, um, I, I had that. I can't wrap my mind. can't bring it up now. But it's where, uh, where they were at there at, at Pansia or Caesarea Philippi, according to King James. They, uh, they could see Mount Horum. Now, it, Mount Horum is forever in the minds of the Jews in, uh, in Israel because uh, it, was, it was there. There's a lot of history there. Uh, Joshua fought one of the last battles just below Mount Horum. Uh, he, and, and there is where the river of Jordan begins, the river of Jordan. They had just passed by all these little tributaries that come down off that mountain that would form the river of Jordan. It's just like, you know, the Ohio River is formed by tributaries up north, the Green River, the, the Mississippi River, all of them in the east runs down to the Mississippi and forms the Mississippi. Well, this is how Jordan was formed, coming off the snows of Mount Horum. So, and where they were at Pansia was a cavern in the side of the mountain, in the side of the rock, and there was water gushing out of that. If you go to other states, you see that. I remember turkey hunting in Arkansas, and you get there in the Ozarks, some of the beautiful, most beautiful sights. I mean, holes in rocks, you could drive my pickup truck up in a ways, and water just gushing out of it, cold water gushing, you know. We have springs here, but they just kind of bubble up, you know, out of the ground, real so sleep seep out of hills. But other places have these, 
have in the mountains they have these springs that gush. Well, this was what Pansia was known for. Now, here's what this is. I'm going to go from the Bible to history. Okay, at Pansia, from the word Pansia is where we get the word pandemonium and panic, because once a year in the spring they would have this feast, and I can't even. I can't even amongst adults uh, speak of the things that they did during this feast. They believed that the God Pan would come out of that cavern. And when he did, all hell broke loose, literally. It was bestiality, men with animals, women with animals, men with men, women with men, on and on and on and on. And it's where we get the term pandemonium. This is where Jesus took his totally mean, his disciples, and, and I believe they were just boys, to one of the most ungodly places there would be to teach them one of the most wonderful truths that was ever written, that there would be a church, that Christ would build the church, that he would build it on a foundation which was not Peter but it would be on him and faith in him. And so there they are. And so he, he begins the conversation by asking two questions. And he knew the answer to both of them. Do you think he already knew? They were rhetorical questions to him, wasn't they? Huh? <laughs> Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What are people saying? Now, of course, they said, uh, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elias, one of the prophets. And they were being kind because that ain't all they were saying about Jesus, you know. I could go out here and say, ask my friends, well, what are people saying about me? Oh, Brother Gary, they're saying that you're a pretty good preacher, you know. You're, you're kind of losing it in your old age and all this. But, you know, but you could ask my enemies and... And, but if my friends was truthful, they was pro would probably be here. And th they could have said, Jesus, they say you're a wine bibbler. You're a gluttonous man. You're casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub, the prince of flies. And they could go on and on and on and on. But they were kind. And they, because they loved this man, and they said, some say you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. That's what, that's what Herod was saying, wasn't it? He was scared to death that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. And then they said, well, some say that thou art Elias. Well, they knew the scriptures. They knew that the scriptures said that Elias would first come before the Messiah would come, right? And, of course, we see that in the spirit, his spirit in, in John the Baptist. Um, then there were those that said, Jeremiah, and this, was, this here was legend and untruthful, Jeremiah had hid the Ark of the Covenant, much of the sacred writings, in, in a cave. And then when right before the Messiah comes, that Jeremiah would raise from the dead and reveal all of these holy, uh, holy grail, holy instruments unto the nation of Israel. So some say in your Jeremiah's, and the Messiah will be along later. And... Uh, and uh, then others would say, look, I don't know that he's all of these guys, but we believe that he's a prophet of old, right? So that's where they're at, and that's what they told him. And he already knew what they were saying. Uh, and he didn't get it through the grapevine, okay? Uh, he knows the end before the beginning. So then he said, the second question, and he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Whom say ye that I am? Don't you believe that he already knew Peter's heart, huh? Do you believe that God, that the Lord knew that you would be saved before you got saved and when you would be saved and the conviction and the message? And you say, boy, that sounds a whole lot like predestination. No, it don't. It's foreknowledge. There's, and that's where people get confused, you know, on predestination. It's foreknowledge. God knows it all. He knows it all. When I prayed that prayer in Vietnam that night, that when I get home, God, if you'll let me get out of here, 
tonight I will serve you. I will live for you. And he knew I would lie to him for two years before, before finally I would bow my heart and say, God, save me. Save me. He knows it. He know, I don't understand. How could I understand the mind of God? I can't even understand my mind sometimes. Uh, but we should have the mind of God. And the mind of God is God is everything. He holds all power. He has all knowledge. He understands everything. And he knew what Peter would do. And he asked these questions to generate thought and to be able to teach them about this blessed entity that he was going to place on planet earth. Whom do men say that I am? And then he said, whom do you say that I I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Christ. He identified him as two different individuals or entities or however you would put it. First he said, Thou art the Christ. You're the King of Israel. You're the Prince. You're the the Priest of Israel. This Christ, the anointed one of God. He was anointed to be the king. He was anointed to be the priest. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that not only of Israel as Peter was thinking, but he's our king. If you don't believe me, just ask the old black preacher. That's my king. And uh, what was it? He was a seven-way king, wasn't he? The black preacher said, the king of heaven, the king of glory, the king of righteousness, the king of the king of seven, the king of Israel, the king of kings, the Lord of kings. He, he, he gave seven-way kings, gave him a seven-way kingship. But Peter was just thinking about Israel. You're the king. You're the Christ. You're, going, you're our priest. When he said you're the Christ, which means the anointed one of God. Then he said the son of the living God. The son of the living God. He made him over all of the universe, didn't he? Over all of the He set him above all. You're the son of God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. You know what he's saying here? Now he said, you're the son of God. And Peter said, everybody knows you're the son of Jonah. Bar-Jonah means son of Jonah. In other words, yes, I am as much the son of God as you're the, as much as you are the son of Jonah. And that's how we ought to look at it, right? How could he be the son of God? How could I be the son of Hayward Emery? Huh? How can you be the son of your father? God did it. God put it all together. God laid it all out. And God determined in the councils in uh, eternity past, somewhere, before the earth ever began, before it was ever formed, he determined that his son Jesus Christ would come into this world, die for the sins of the world, resurrect the third day, and um, and be a sin back to the right hand of the Father. It was predetermined that he would come For the salvation of humanity. His son. I am just as much the son of God. I am the son of God. Like you are the son of Jonah. Blessed are you. Why is he blessed? Because he got a revelation from God. Didn't he? Now guys let me tell you. And I I know I. Sometimes to. Some Christians, I'm just a stick in the mud. But I just want truth, right? There are no new revelations. Are you hearing me? Well, I just, the TV preacher said, I just got a new revelation from God. You know what he wants? He wants more money. That's why he got a new revelation from God, because it wasn't of God. It was something he dreamed up. The the revelations from God... Ended in chapter 22 of the Revelation, verse, what is it, 22? Said and over. 
That's why we have Mormonism because somebody bought into the new revelation. Somebody, that's why we have the Jehovah's false witnesses. Somebody believed the new revelation and they're springing up everywhere and they're right in the Baptist churches. When Baptist people can ordain women, they have had a new revelation from God which is not from God at all. As Paul said to the Galatians, another gospel which is not another gospel at all. Why? Because the Bible teaches us about ordination. Who are the leaders of the church? Who are the overseers of the church? And that's what you go by. No new revelation. Not my feelings. Forget Brother Gary. Let's believe the Word of God. And though an angel, though Paul or an angel of light come preach another, some other revelation, gospel, he said, count them a curse. No new re- Peter got an inspiration from God. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. It's called inspiration. Peter was not inspired. The word that he spoke was inspired, right? Paul was not inspired. The word he spoke was inspired from God. Does that make sense? I talked with uh, Brother Woody the other day, and he was agonizing with the death of our friend. And um, I got two or three calls, you know. And um, I'll go ahead and say it over, you know, Brother David Youngblood. Uh, I told David's daughter at the coffin, I said, your daddy was a pastor's pastor. Pastors called him. Uh, he had, he's helped me through the years. He was just a brilliant mind that loved the Lord and the Word of God. And mo- uh, those of you that knew him knew that. Um, but there were younger pastors that were, were struggling with it. And I talked to one again this week and just broke down, you know. And, and the question is, why? You know, why, you know, why Brother David? You know, uh, why Paul? I talked to one. I said, you know, I've often thought, Paul is my hero in the faith, second to Jesus. Um, at the time when it looked like the church needed the Apostle Paul the most, God allowed him, allowed Rome to take him out there, lay his head on a chop block, and cut his head off. And his head rolled over in a basket. End of story. End of story. Why? Because it was never about Paul. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just servants. We're just servants. And somebody had to pick up the mantle and take the gospel to another generation. And somebody will with Brother David Youngblood. Maybe not in the power or the wisdom of David Youngblood. Maybe in some ways more. But it has to be of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is taken to this next generation. That's why it is so important to instill and to indoctrinate our kids here at Duval's Chapel with nothing but the Word of God. The Word of God. Forget what I feel and what I believe. Now, I... I love to feel the Holy Spirit, right? I I, I believe in worshiping, but why? Because that's what the Bible teaches. It goes back to the Word of God. But nothing can frame a church but the truth of God's Word, a church that will stand. So he said, the reason you're blessed is because God gave you the inspired word. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. My father in heaven has revealed this to you. Now, at this point, he's revealed that the church would come. Now, what's the church? Well, the Greeks had churches. They had churches. You know what the church meant to the Greeks? The assembly, assemble, 
the assembly of free men. They called it the church. They had gatherings of free men. Slaves couldn't be a part of the church. Guess what? I'm no longer a slave to sin. God delivered me from that and put me into the church, which actually the definition is called out ones. Called out, called out from the world. Saved by grace, washed in the blood, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and no longer a servant of sin. A servant of sin. Now I serve Christ. That's the church. And there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the church of the living God. Doesn't matter what the nickname. Baptist is a nickname. General Baptist is a nickname. Pentecostal is a nickname. We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. My, all my Church of Christ friends would have said amen to that, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and she's beautiful. She's not perfect, but she's beautiful. She's the beautiful bride of Christ. And so look, we don't need to put anything on her that Christ has not adorned her with. Right? I'm saying outside of the word, Anything outside of the word doesn't add to the church. It takes away from her beauty and who she is. I've told you the story that I can't think of his name now that I heard tell about the church, the bride. and He told the story like the, uh, uh, the prince was going away and, and he left the bride to his servants, his bride to his servants. And he said, you keep her. Till I come again. Uh, he adorned her in just a white garment. In beauty. In, in um, perfection. Which I, by that I mean completeness. He gave her everything she needed. Till he got back. He, gave, he shared her with gifts and oils. And things that the bride would love. Just like Christ has the church. Nine gifts of the Holy Spirit he left us. He robed us in a robe that is washed in his blood. But when this prince came back, they had made her look like the world. They had, they had adorned her with jewels and, and heavy makeup and, and clothes that were worldly and, and not modest. And he almost didn't know who she was when he saw her. Is this not what the world is, the church is doing today? We're accepting everything and anything into our fellowship when Christ teaches us how to build the church, what she should look like, how she should act, and we should want it that way. Well, we just can't get them in if we're not more inclusive or more user-friendly, worldly-friendly. What? Diverse. Guys, I just believe the Bible. It hasn't changed. I can't change it. I can change, but I can't change the Bible. There's two things you do with the Word of God. You reject it or you accept it because you're not going to change it. You may think you can, but you can't do it. You can't do it. Um, upon this rock, I'll finish with that verse, the, or ditto. Uh, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, that's verse 18, I didn't read it, and upon this rock I will build my church. And, he, see, and I'll tell you something else that I left out early. You know what they called that cavern in the side of Mount, in the foot of Mount Horm there? The gates of hell. Because that's where Pan came out of. And hail was in that mountain. And all of hail was unleashed upon this little society there. And the gates of hail shall not prevail against it. Thank God. Thank God. Breaks my heart. Churches that I used to preach in that were full of the power of God and the word of God. And, and men of God stood in the pulpits and trembled now are just, uh, they were full of the revival fire and now they're existing in religious smoke. And uh, 
great organizations like the Methodists. My goodness, it ought to break our heart when we look at where the Methodists are and who they were in yesteryear and how they helped build this country into what it was, a Bible-believing uh, country uh, and now. And our ba the Baptists are going the same way, guys. Going the same way. At the last Baptist convention, man, they, they knocked it out over an issue that should have been elementary. Uh, and the general Baptists, if it's not careful, will follow suit. But we don't have to. We don't have to. When Christ comes, he's going to find faith. Let him find it right here at Duval's Chapel. Okay? Let him find it right here at Duval's Chapel. And it'll be up to you. Um, I won't be here. I'm going to come with him, see, to meet you guys in the air. Because all of you are younger than me and more healthy. And, you know, you don't have to be young or old to die. But thank God I'm now is my salvation nearer than when I first believed. Right? Any questions or thoughts? Anything at all? Anything? Are you glad to be a part of the church, a member of the church? Not member of Duba, a member of the church. A member of the church. Every one of you could tell me your testimony. Tell us your testimony when that happened, when it happened. You, I didn't understand everything that God did for me that night. All I knew, I was lost, and the preacher with a finger that long spit on everybody on five rows told me that Jesus would save me if I would come to him. And I did, and he did. And life has never been the same. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you think that, you know, talking about you didn't understand, you don't think any of us understand when we take that first step? <laughs> Peter sure didn't understand. Mm -mm. He didn't understand what he just told you. Mm -mm. No. And he didn't until after Pentecost, after he got saved and... Yeah. Boy, I tell you, you got to love old Peter, oh, don't you? Man, can you imagine how he felt when he stepped over the edge of that boat and it didn't sink, the water didn't sink, you know? Boy, I've wanted to get out of that boat a lot of times and I just, one foot, you know? And we criticize Peter, but I'm telling you, he holds the record for walking on water next to Jesus. He does. You can criticize him all you want to. None of you have walked on. I've never seen it. You know, I've been looking since I've been here. No. Um, it's a glorious way, guys. It's a glorious way. We ought to be working overtime to lead others down this path. It's a tough time to do it, man. I'm telling you, everything out there is pulling against the lost people. I'm glad I got saved when I did. If I'd have lived... If I were living now and 23 years old or 22 when I got saved, I'm, you know what? I, something of the world may have charmed me more than the Holy Spirit and, and the church. Uh, I'm glad I got saved. Amen. Ronnie, you glad? You glad to be a Christian, buddy? Amen. Anything else? Anything?